Hi, everybody. I am Dr. Keith Beard, and welcome to WonderCon at Home um, and our presentation, How Does Love Influence Our Favorite Disney and Other Characters? Um, thought I'd introduce myself a little bit. Um, I am a professor at Marshall University. I'm also a clinical psychologist, and I have a small private practice. Um, and at Marshall, I am also the director of our clinical psychology doctoral program. So if people are interested in psychology, we have a great department and Marshall's a great school. You should check things out. Um, what I would like to do is have my other panelists um, introduce themselves and maybe um, tell us a little bit about um, how you're doing uh, with the pandemic and this great pause that's going on. Um, and maybe what you're you're spending your time doing, what you're watching, what you're streaming, those sorts of things. So let's start with April. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm April Fugit, and I have a PhD in cognitive psychology. I'm also a professor at Marshall University, and I do all of the most fun things um, in these presentations with my two wonderful colleagues. I do the statistics and the methodology, and so everything that you're going to see today is um, methodologically sound and um, statistically backed. So we have a lot of really cool data I'm excited to share with you. Um, what have I been doing over the Great Pause? Um, data analyses, um, that's been a big part of it. Um, I am happy to report that I have streamed every possible Winnie the Pooh anything on Disney Plus that I can possibly find, going through all of that. Um, stream some Scooby-Doo. That's been, been some good background noise as I've been um, working from home. How about you, Dr. Black? Hi, I'm Brittany. Um, I am also a clinical psychologist, actually a graduate of the amazing program that Keith is referencing from Marshall. Um, and I work as an instructor and licensed psychologist for the Marshall Medical School um, for their Department of Psychiatry. Um, as far as what I've been doing, I have also put more Scooby-Doo than I meant to on as background noise and have gone down the gamut of that. Um, and I got really lucky that the new season of DuckTales um, happened to hit, so I've been binging every episode of that. How about you, Keith? You didn't answer that, your own question. That's true. Um, unlike you two, you two have kind of gone with comfort food. Um, and comfort shows, you know, um, kind of old school. I've been doing a lot of the new shows or things that I haven't watched. Um, I kind of see this um, great pause as um, a way to catch up on things that I haven't had time uh, to watch previously. So um, I just finished uh, Ragnarok on Netflix, which is basically Smallville uh, for Thor. Um, and I'm a big superhero Smallville fan, so I I'm enjoying that. Um, I finished Pennyworth. And I watched this um, Disney documentary that was really kind of weird. It was about this prince uh, or king, and he was looking for his prince, and he kept talking to lions and tigers, and there was some witch. At least I think she was a witch. He kept calling her Carol and a witch or something that rhymed with that. And I forget what it was called. It, was, it wasn't Lion King. Tiger King King. Tiger King. Tiger King. Tiger King. That's what it was. Disney documentaries have really changed. I'm, uh, not what I expected. It's all those live action shifts. It, it is. They, it's the new, new direction, Keith. Mm -hmm. Well, let's get started on things. So when we started this research, we initially uh, focused on personality, which is defined as the unique and relatively stable and enduring internal and external characteristics, including thoughts, feelings, and actions that influence behavior and may change in response to different situations. Now, over the years, um, we've expanded our research to look at both positive and negative aspects of personality. And we've gradually kind of started to add in additional um, psychological concepts and phenomena, uh, things like uh, love and shipping, uh, career choices, uh, psychological disorders, and we've also expanded um, our focus uh, on pop culture. Initially, we were just kind of looking at characters that people liked and, and kind of what was going on with personality in those characters, and we've added shows um, as well as anime and fandoms and gaming and internet sensation or influencers. 
So yeah, as Keith said, over time, we really have kind of kept going with this and really expanded on that initial personality trait um, study that we were doing. So one of the things we've been looking at a lot more recently are love styles and the influence that has on the pop culture that you love. So we've been using um, the Hendrick and Hendrick um, scale with the citation linked there um, for what we've been doing. And with this, it talks about different styles of love. So you have Ludos or Ludus, um, which is that conquest and game playing love that you kind of see for some people versus pragma, which is more practicality. So something that feels logical, um, a little bit more shopping list kind of style love. Versus mania, which is that obsessive, possessive, dependent love that you kind of see for some things. And then we have kind of to wrap it up, eros, which is that romantic, passionate love versus storge, which is your friendship love versus agape, which is that selfless um, love that you see. So going forward. So I want to be really clear here. Um, we've been collecting different, um, different experiments and different um, IRB protected and approved projects for the last, uh, about the last seven years now. And um, we've been measuring love for the last three. And I've done two separate sets of analyses um, on love. And for the record, I just want to be clear across both sets of those analyses. Um, the statistical analysis, there are no significant differences between individuals who identify as LGBTQ plus and those individuals who do not identify as LGBTQ plus across any of those six different measures of love. They are exactly the same. And as a matter of fact, um, they really differ by less than one point in most cases. And that's definitely not statistically different. Um, so love really is just love and we've kind of been seeing it over and over again in different experiments and, and different data sets and things like that except if you're a disney fan <laughs> and if you're a disney fan love isn't isn't just love it's something different and um you're going to hear me say it multiple times in this presentation disney ruins everything and love is one of the places it ruins I don't know why she thinks that Disney ruins everything. It's like the happiest place on earth, right? Uh huh. So, um, actually, who put this slide on here in this picture? Brittany? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, they all know that I'm not a big mini fan. Um, I think it's the five year old boy who fell in love with Disney. Um, Minnie's real girly, you know, ribbons and bows and polka dots, and that's not what a little five-year-old boy um, is interested in. Plus, let's face it, she shows her bloomers to everybody. What's up with that? You know, um, so I don't think that Disney ruins everything. I think it's great. <laughs> um, Clearly, and, you have your own ears on and, uh, lockdown. And they yes. flash. <laughs> and uh, when we look at Disney and love, um, we actually find that Disney fans love more than other fandoms uh, with it. It doesn't matter what the sexual orientation is. It doesn't matter what the sexual identity is. Um, Disney fans just kind of love uh, more. They score significantly higher on four out of the six love styles. Although Eros was just marginally um, significant, it was still significant. The only two that didn't come out um, significant for Disney fans was um, Ludos, which is that conquest or the game playing type of love, and Mania, uh, which is that obsessional love. And that kind of makes sense then since those are not the types of love that we typically see or that we typically associate um, with Disney. So, Look at that. I, I got the clinicians saying marginally statistically significant. You did get the clinician no. statistical. My brain hurts a little bit now. Maybe it's the ears. I'm so if you know some real science today. <laughs> so why do I say that love ruins everything? Or not love ruins everything. Love doesn't ruin anything. Or maybe love really does ruin everything. <laughs> you know more about Freud than I do, Keith. I don't know. Was there a Freudian slip? Yeah. April is really a Disney villain. Okay. You all will go figure that out. So she's trying to squash love. <laughs> if love even exists, and it probably doesn't. But anyway, um, so well, Disney ruins everything. 
when um, we started collecting data in 2014, um, we kind of were focused on pop culture in general, and we were kind of focused on the heroes and villains of pop culture. And so that first list had about 500 characters on it, and we asked people how much they liked each of the characters, and these were our um, most popular characters. And Keith looked at me and he said, I think we're missing out here. I don't think we have enough characters. And I said, we have 500 characters, Keith. And he said, I don't think it's enough characters. We need to add some more. We need to add some Disney characters. And I said, okay, we can add some more, but we are not adding Disney characters. I just, I don't want to deal with Disney characters. It's just, it's just, they don't really fit with everything else that we're doing. He said, okay, so let's just add some more. So that's what we did in 2015. You can see that we've got some changes here. Um, some of this is actually attributed to like when movies are being released and things like that. So you see Katniss Everdeen moving down just a little bit, that's Hunger Games, when things are released and kind of in the zeitgeist, that kind of thing. Then he came back to me again and he said, 2016, we've been collecting data for so long. We need to up the number of characters that we are collecting again and we need to add Disney. And he wore me down and I said, fine, let's, let's add Disney. And so I ran the data and um, this is the um, list that I would like to show you. The first one that was up here, the Spider-Man is number one. But when we actually looked at the data with the Disney characters in it, Disney ruined everything. Disney is by far the top places there. So you see Spider-Man drop from one to three and you see Batman drop from two to 10. And then you see everybody drop out of the top 10 and most of them actually drop out of the top 20 because Disney just overpowered everything. But love for Disney and all things Disney um, was, was really, really evident. Now, I am going to note here that in 2016, we are seeing a spike from Mickey Mouse. And that comes, becomes very important as we've collected data continuously since then. And, um, and uh, might change Mickey a little bit. So we look specifically at Disney then. And um, over the past five years um, that we've collected participants and to see what were the most like Disney characters themselves. And so um, Jeannie has consistently come out on top. And we really think, especially if we're looking over the past five years, that might be an influence of Robin Williams and uh, the live action uh, movie. Maybe the same thing going on with Simba there and the Lion King, since there's been a recent movie, um, that that might be part of what um, is making these particular Disney characters popular. And then during this pandemic, the great pause that's going on, we look to see currently, because we're still collecting data um, actively, uh, what is it that kind of uh, came up as popular? And this is a list for that. And again, going back to kind of what um, April and Brittany were talking about in terms of what they were watching, it kind of looks like people are really going back to kind of that comfort, old school movies and, and characters that kind of brought them joy when they were younger, kind of in these turmoil times, um, kind of finding comfort back in the things that, that made us um, happy before. One I'm gonna point, go sorry, sorry, Keith. I was uh -huh. gonna point out one other thing on here. Um, I just wanna be really clear, the sample size for the data on the Great Pause is significantly smaller than the sample size of the population we've been using um, for the last five years or so. It's been less time to collect data and um, less opportunity to collect data too. So it is a smaller sample size. So just keep that in mind when you're looking at that list. Um, I was also gonna add, Prozone cracks me up. Um, I actually streamed um, Prozone as part of a Netflix party with one of my classes um, for office hours and um, they chose to watch Incredibles too. And I just, I don't get it. I just don't get it. I don't get you people. <laughs> The, the other thing, actually, you're pointing out some interesting things. One other thing that I kind of want to point out is that on both of these lists, it doesn't matter, both of them, the big five um, are not there. The Mickey, Minnie, uh, Donald, Goofy, Pluto, um, they don't make the top list over um, the past five years or even now, which I thought was kind of really interesting. So let's go on. So again, getting back to what April and I originally started out with, you know, we really were starting out looking at the heroes and the villains in pop culture, in particular, the big ones that went with those. So the Star Wars characters, the Marvel characters, the DC characters, 
And you can see in this list with Yoda being the number, the top slot, um, the top non-Disney character that we had, those characters are popular. Um, and I also will do the plug, I get really excited to see Game of Thrones. That's another study we've kind of started to look at and add into data. Um, you see these kind of big hero figures in pop culture show up as the top characters, which makes April and I really excited until we then realize that all the Disney characters have higher numbers. So even though we are picking on Keith for Mickey not making any of the top Disney lists, um, Mickey and all those characters that you saw on the previous slides totally blow these characters out of the water and have much higher numbers. Um, I will point out um, with Yoda, we did not necessarily distinguish baby Yoda, so the child from the new um, Disney Plus show, The Mandalorian versus Yoda. Um, this is more of the traditional Yoda character on this slide. We are currently collecting more data, um, specifically with Star Wars that will feature baby Yoda. Um, we just have not, have not quite looked at that yet. Baby but, Yoda and The Mandalorian. Yeah. We're, gonna get, we're gonna get Mando data. Yeah, so we, that is something that is um, to be continued. Um, but for now, we see these characters kind of from the subset that is not solely Disney um, kind of popping and showing up more for us. So uh, this really kind of brought a couple of other questions to the forefront. So we're seeing Disney as a fandom, and you clearly saw in that last slide, the heroes, we got a lot more Marvel than we had a lot of DC, which is a trend that we have seen basically since we've been collecting data, um, actually. And so we started to become more interested in fandoms themselves and measuring specific fandoms. And so we have added a fandom measure to our data collection tools. And this one that we're using measures three different types of fans. It measures the enthusiastic fan. So how much do you love or care for um, your specific object of fan identification? So how much do you love Mickey Mouse geese? Um, Kate's also a Superman guy, so it's just the juggernaut of Disney, you know, fandom. Yep. Um, the appreciative fan is how much kind of internal emotional connection you have with that character, that fan identification object, and so it's really internal feelings. And that social interaction with the fandom is that external kind of behavioral measure of how much you know, are you actually able to interact with other people? So are you on Tumblr? Are you on um, chat boards? Are you, you know, going to fan conventions? So that's that external kind of component. And if you put all that together, you kind of get the total fan or, um, or a stan even. So we've been collecting data on some fandoms. You're gonna see that um, we have a lot of fandoms on this list. This is not all of the fandoms that we have on this list. We are still kind of newly collecting data on this. And so we do have other fandoms on the list that we don't have any endorsement for. We don't have enough endorsement for, for them to actually make the chart just yet. But what you really see here kind of, you know, above and beyond all of the others, you get Marvel and you get Star Wars and you get Disney. And so you get those three together, which really is all Disney. And that's where you get that real kind of love for Disney as a theme park or Disney as a total kind of package of fandoms. So. And kind of similarly, as we've started to shift and look at more specific fandoms, we've also looked at specific generations. So as we started collecting the Disney data, and thinking about you know, how long those characters have been with us in pop culture, how long characters like Superman and Batman and, and even the Marvel juggernauts have been in pop culture, we really wanted to look at how does that change how much somebody from different generations loves those characters. So in more recent studies, we have specifically asked in our demographics, our basic information we're asking from participants to identify what generation they belong to. And I wanna be specific in saying we ask them what they belong to, because I'm aware some of these generations have overlaps and it can really be about kind of what you identify as um, versus maybe the specifics of the dates. But we do have specific dates on that slide um, for you in case you're interested in knowing more about it. But we do see huge differences with these, which is really cool to kind of look at um, and that we've been really excited to see. 
In particular, when we look at the generation shifts with the big five personality traits, which is a specific measure that we've used um, pretty heavily and throughout all of our studies. So the first stream I'm gonna talk about is conscientiousness, which is really that idea of somebody who has a lot of um, traits re resolving around responsibility and productivity and being very organized as a person. And with that trait, we see that baby boomers kind of blow out, um, blow the millennials out of the water. They are much higher on conscientiousness, conscientiousness excuse me, um, than what we see with our millennial participants. And similarly, neuroticism, which we also kind of label sometimes as emotional stability or instability. So those are people who maybe have traits that are, you know, higher in moodiness or intensity or even anxiety. Um, so within that realm, we see the millennials are more neurotic than the baby boomers. And then finally, um, Gen X is significantly different even from the baby boomers and that Gen X is also more neurotic than baby boomers. Um, but again, the millennials are still the most neurotic of all. I am going to jump in here on this slide um, and say really quickly, these are all statistically significant differences. So the difference between millennials and Gen X isn't on there because it wasn't statistically different. So again, kind of going more into this, and again, all of the information regarding stats, April is our total guru and can totally jump in whenever. Um, but we see these um, continued shifts looking at other personality traits. So we look at the big five as kind of that more positive personality traits versus the dark triad, which we kind of label a little bit more as the darker side, the maybe traits you don't necessarily want somebody to have. So within that, you see Machiavellianism, um, which, you know, that's kind of somebody who's maybe more focused on their own exploits, more manipulative of other people. We see that Gen Z is different from all the other generations um, and that Gen Z is actually more Machiavellian than other generations. Baby boomers and Gen X are the least in terms of the Machiavellianism trait. Narcissism, which is, we hear that word quite a bit right now, but narcissism is that idea of somebody who's very grandiose or self-centered, maybe a little bit more self-focused. I know April usually likes to say that she belongs in this trait, but we see people within this, Gen Z is significantly different from millennials. Um, Gen Z tends to be more narcissistic than any other generation, um, but more so in comparison to baby, baby boomers who are less narcissistic. I am also going to jump in here and say two things. One, the sample size that we have on Gen Z is the smallest of all of our groups. And that's purely a function of um, all of our studies are approved by our Office of Research Integrity or our IRB. And um, a lot of the Gen Z kids are kids. They're under 18, so we can't sample them. Um, the other thing that I'm going to remind you of, yes, I am aware, Brittany, that I am narcissistic. However, this is not clinical narcissism as the two of you would define it. Um, these are not clinical levels. These are just um, kind of higher than average levels if you want to think about it that way. So careful. <laughs> it is a trait, not a disorder. Fair. Thank you. Okay, She's going sure. after me with Minnie Mouse and after you with narcissism, we're going to have to get on her. I don't know. Are you bloomers? Bloomers? You use the word bloomer. I think you're showing your generation a bit there, Keith. Bloomers. And finally, I'll quickly do this because I can tell everybody wants to go move on. Um, we have psychopathy, which is somebody who kind of lacks empathy and is a little bit more impulsive in what they do. And we see that Gen Z is, again, significantly different from Gen X and from baby boomers. Uh, Gen Z has higher psychopathic um, tendencies than Gen X and the baby boomers, who are the least. I'm just glad that Gen X is like on here. We can, it's our, our participation award key. <laughs> so we did collect all of this data um, from generational information. And while we were doing that, we were thinking about, um, you know, 90 years of superheroes and 90 years of Mickey and Disney. And so we looked at um, every kind of animated show, cartoon, movie, special that you could think of. Um, we programmed some nice conditional logic so people wouldn't take days to complete our survey. And um, we collected data on all of these. And through that standard data collection technique, these were our most popular shows. Some of these weren't surprising at all. Scooby-Doo doesn't surprise me. It's, it's a dog. So we all love dogs, right? 
Um, some of them were a little bit more um, surprising to me. I am a huge pinky in the brain girl. I'm a, I'm a huge brain fan. Um, I really like seeing that on this list. We've also collected this data during the Great Pause. Again, the sample size is a little bit smaller than I would like. Um, but for the most part, you know, it's the same shows. They're in a slightly different order, um, but we're not seeing anything that's too, too terribly different. The big one on here for me that I'm going to go ahead and point out, because we actually did this for characters too, is that Powerpuff Girls have made a, made a huge jump from the standard data collection into the Great Pause data collection. So it's, it's much higher on that list. So for our standard data collection, Scooby-Doo, again, most popular character. Um, these characters do include Disney characters. You can see Darkwing Duck is on the list. Um, Mickey is not on this list because Mickey did not make this list. He was not high enough. And he usually tends to be the highest of the kind of the big five, as Keith was saying earlier, the big five characters. And so if it, they're not on here, it's because they're not on here. In the Great Pause, we collected the data set again. Again, some, some pretty standard kind of results that we expected. Dory doesn't surprise me because if you remember back to Keith's list earlier, um, Dory was the one that we were seeing as the top of Disney. So when you, you know, put that in with everybody, we still get that Dory spike. Um, Winnie the Pooh is a little bit higher than I would have expected. And of course, we see the Powerpuff Girls again. And so they've moved up not only as the show, but as um, popularity with the characters. And it could be an artifact of the sample size, of course. Um, or it could be that people are watching the Powerpuff Girls. I'd like to think that it's because people are watching the Powerpuff Girls. Um, in terms of this list, too, I would just like for you to um, keep in mind that you know, we've done different things. We've collected a lot of data over the years. We're still collecting data. These are all backed by statistical significance and different sample sizes. And of course, I'd be happy to discuss any of that in detail with anybody who is curious. But these are all actual experiments that we've done with, you know, um, collected data and things like that. So these don't necessarily reflect what we want to see on the list. Um, these aren't our opinions. I can tell you I was pretty thrilled to see so many Winnie the Pooh characters on this list because that is what I was binge watching too. Um, but it's not what Keith has been watching. And so it's interesting that sometimes it works out in our favor and sometimes it just doesn't. So these are all data driven, not personal driven. And so that kind of concludes some of the material and information uh, that we have been uh, researching and wanted to talk about. I will also note that our um, art within our PowerPoint is also all cited by the artist. Um, we try to take, um, you know, uh, citations and, and giving people credit um, very um, importantly. Um, and focus on that and make sure that we give people credit where it's due with it. But what I'd like to do right now is maybe open it up to some questions and um, see what um, people might be wondering. Hi there, I really enjoyed your presentation. I was wondering what nostalgic show you were most surprised to see at the top of the list. Thank you. So who wants to go first um, with the, here's the, the most liked shows. I'll go first since I'm talking. Um, I know for me, um, it really kind of is interesting um, to me with the Flintstones. Uh, for me, the the very old, I think of it as old, old school, you're making fun of me for saying bloomers, um, that that those came on there and actually with one of the characters, one of the most popular characters in The Great Pause was Rosie the Robot, which is the Jetsons. Mm -hmm. um, so. So the, for me, um, those are kind of the things that um, surprised me uh, with the outcome. Somebody else? I would say I was actually the opposite. So I'm the millennial in the group here, and I can remember watching those shows growing up. So they're super nostalgic to me. So for me, the thing that was actually has been shocking to see on the list is um, as much as I love it, Futurama. Um, that to me doesn't feel like a nostalgic show as much as I love it and, and I'm so happy to see it on this list. Um, it, it carries a different weight and kind of a different meaning to me than some of the other shows. 
Those are both really good answers. Um, I think for me, it's fairly odd parents just because I think that poor Tammy Turner is like the, it's, it's not a positive show. Um, you know, he's got somebody, his teacher who follows him around and gives him S and I don't know, as a, as a professor myself, that just, I don't know, it bothers me. And he's got kind of neglectful parents and then he kind of screws everything up too. I don't know. It's just kind of sad. I don't know. I don't know why anybody likes it. <laughs> All right. Well, let's take another question. It seems like baby boomers are better off than some other generations. Less neurotic, less narcissistic, more conscientious, moral, and honest. Why do you think there is this generational difference? I think for me, there's really, maybe there really isn't a generational difference. Ooh, I hate saying that. Um, <laughs> but when you think about it from other perspectives of psychology, when you think about like humanistic psychology and you think about something like self-actualization from Maslow and it really takes time to be able to get to those levels and it takes, you know, kind of basic safety needs being met and, um, you know, self-esteem has to kind of be met and those different things. And so I think that um, boomers have had the time to kind of developmentally reach some of those milestones and kind of settle into themselves literally as a self in a way that um, definitely a Gen Z person wouldn't do and then definitely something that the younger Millennials haven't had a chance to do yet especially given you know previous and current economy issues. Mm -hmm. I kind of um, agree in the in kind of the same way with it the the baby boomers have experienced so much stuff and so I think they've developed these coping skills along the way from World War II to Vietnam War to 9-11 um, to now the, the great pandemic and great pause that's going on with it. Um, these are new stressors for other people and for younger generations, but these older generations have, have um, kind of settled in. And I think um, I know thinking about my parents who are a little older and some things, you know, this, this pandemic isn't really um, bothering them as much as what I think um, it is with my college students. Uh, with it. They're like, yeah, we've survived this or we've survived that. Um, we'll make it through this too. So. Yeah, I, I would agree as well. I think, I think you made a really good point, Keith, with that of, you know, what's happening and how people are coping with things and looking at the millennial generation, thinking about, you know, 9-11 was such a, a defining part of the childhood and then the recession as we were going to college and now this as most of us are starting careers and families and all of that. Um, I think it, it is just a matter of the experiences and how you form those coping skills. Why do you think the classic Disney characters, Mickey, Donald, Minnie, aren't higher on the lists? Crushes my soul. <laughs> <laughs> um, why do I think they're not higher on the list? Personally, um, I think they're liked by everybody. And so I think it just kind of um, washes them out uh, with it, where I think, you know, certain groups really kind of push for, for certain um, characters. And so I think that's why they might not show up is that they're just kind of universal, um, but not super high with everybody. Everybody just kind of, we all like them, you know? So that's kind of my thought with it. What do y'all think? I think it's because Disney doesn't do anything with them. Now, Disney is probably going to kill Baby Yoda because I said something negative about Disney. But, um, this is watching you. <laughs> they probably are recording this with us. Um, so I think it's because they really don't do much with Mickey in the Big Five. I mean, you've got like one show that's primarily aimed at preschoolers. Um, but other than that, if you're not watching the nostalgic stuff, you know, you're not really getting much exposure to Mickey, Minnie, Donald, Goofy, Pluto, those kinds of characters. Even the characters that you see on the list that you don't see a ton, or maybe their movies are two or three or four years old, they're still showing up in other places. So you get them in Wreck-It Ralph 2 as the princesses, where you get them appearing in other movies um, as a nod. So you see Rapunzel popping up and, you know, Frozen that kind of thing and so they're still kind of word of mouth and it's you see Mickey and the big five less than that I think I think it's just because they're underutilized 
Yeah, and they used to be very utilized thinking about, you know, the little short um, Disney movies you would get in the theaters even before um, you would see the newest movie. Whereas even, you know, before the Great Pauls hit with um, Disney putting Onward in theaters, you had a shift of them using The Simpsons as their kind of like pre-movie short versus maybe some of those classic characters they had previously done. So I, I don't know if they're using them in the same way anymore. Let's take one more question. Why do you think Disney is loved so much more than so many other characters and shows? So why is Disney loved so much more than everybody else? Um, I think it is so ingrained in our culture. Um, and I think everybody is the happiest place on earth, you know? So I think that um, it, it's just like some kind of this juggernaut of a thing because um, everybody has some positive um, aspect of it that they kind of hold on to from their childhood. Other thoughts? I think we're brainwashed to love them. I think they're, <laughs> I think they're just everywhere. They're just everywhere. I mean, they so are. they are. I mean, you can't really go into, I mean, look, you can't go into a store without seeing Disney merch and, um, you know, I mean, I have, I have a Gen Z kid and, you know, one of the markers of kind of his childhood was, have you taken him to Disney World yet? Yes, we did. For those of you um, watching this, um, I was unhappy about it, um, but we have taken him and it's just this marker and it's, it's, it's not just, I think cultural kind of like Keith was saying, I think it's almost expected where um, it's so much so much exposure. I think that it's just everywhere. It's hard to escape it. It's, it's definitely a powerhouse, especially thinking with recent years with them adding in Marvel and, and Star Wars, just how far the Disney reaches. And, it, and it's continuing to be with newest additions to, you know, kind of incorporating the, you know, the Fox characters and things like that, that they've now bought out. So I think Disney just continues to grow and become such a powerhouse that it's harder to ignore or harder to not find something in that that you like. We would also um, like to um, give a little shout out to, as we affectionately call our minions, um, which are research assistants um, who uh, helped us collect data and analyze data and write things up and um, work on presentations. They all uh, work really hard and um, need to be given some uh, kudos uh, for the work that they do. So thank you all. We will have more work for you to do. <laughs> Can count on it. Uh -huh. And here is our contact information. Um, we're happy to talk to anybody. Our emails are listed there. Uh, please feel free to reach out if you would like. We also have a Facebook page that focuses on our studies and our research, um, as well as Marshall's uh, information. Uh, there and all of their social media outlets uh, with everything. So with that, I want to thank you all for um, taking the time to watch our session. We love doing these sessions and we love that you all have interest and love the things that we love um, and are willing to um, support us in our research. Um, does anybody else have anything else they want to add? I'm just going to reiterate a couple of things. Um, it does say on there for any of our images or our citations. We not only give credit to them on our slides and we love fan art. We are big, uh, big fans of fan art. And actually that's one of my favorite parts about um, a con is picking up some, some, some custom art. Um, we do have the citations if anybody wants to know who did any of them. And we do have citations for the components that we've used in our projects. And um, if you are interested in a college, um, hit us up at Marshall. Um, we, I teach undergraduates. I have a freshman Psych 201 class, which is our intro to psychology class in the fall. Um, Keith teaches in um, all three of our programs. I teach in all three of our programs. Um, I believe Brittany has an honors class on our campus in the fall. What is that class again? Do you remember the title? Um, it is the psychology of YouTube. So influencers, which is a pretty yeah. exciting. Yeah, um, we've been we've been doing research on, on those two for the last few years. So um, if you're looking for a college home, um, look us up. We love it there and we clearly work with our student minions. We love them too. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Stay safe. We'll see you later. <laughs>